Hello everyone. Welcome to Sunday School. I'm Laurel Griffith and it's good to be with you today. We will be um, looking at the book of Titus, a very small book and perhaps not as familiar to you as others in the New Testament. And I think that's because we don't know a, a lot about Titus. So let's get a little context and, and um, explore what we do know before we jump into our focal passage. So Titus was a Gentile follower of Jesus Christ, and he had been um, evangelized by the Apostle Paul. We do not see him mentioned in the book of Acts. However, he is mentioned as one of Paul's traveling companions in the, verse, in the book of 1 Corinthians. And in our passage today, Paul is going to refer to Titus as a son in the faith. So there's a very personal relationship that Paul has with Titus. Um, we, we know that uh, Titus is on the island of Crete. Now, we don't know how the gospel came to the island of Crete. We, we don't have a record of a, a missionary journey to the island of Crete. However, we do have Crete being mentioned uh, in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost and that there were people from the island of Crete there when the Holy Spirit descended. And in perhaps it is, um, we, could, we could believe that there were people who became Christians uh, in, at Pentecost from Crete who then carried the gospel back to the island of Crete. So scholars believe that the Apostle Paul and Titus made a journey to Crete together after Paul was released from Roman prison. So Paul was imprisoned in Rome, was released um, on the first imprisonment. He and Titus travel to Crete and this is where he is evangelizing and establishing churches and, um, and teaching the people. Paul leaves Titus there and places him in charge of bringing these churches um, uh, into maturity, uh, teaching the people and, and mentoring the people and, and just helping these churches get established. So sometime later, probably six, around 65 AD, Paul then sends this letter to Titus. So this is one of the pastoral epistles. Now, this is different than um, many of Paul's letters. Many of Paul's letters, like if you think about Ephesians and Colossians and Galatians, those are letters that were written to churches, to groups of churches in a particular location. But the, um, the book of Titus, as well as the books of First and Second Timothy, are pastoral ep epistles, which that means they are letters that were written to specific individuals. So here, Paul is writing Titus, and he is giving Titus instructions on what Titus is supposed to do um, with these churches uh, and these, these early Christians trying to help them grow into maturity in the faith. So Paul writes Titus addressing a problem that is going on uh, within the area and the churches. So what is the problem? Um, I think perhaps the best way to identify what this particular issue is or uh, the way Paul describes it is to let Paul say it in his own words. So in chapter one, we'll take a look at a couple of verses that gives us a glimpse of what is happening in the churches in Crete. So chapter one, verse 10. There are also many rebellious people, idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching the sordid gain of what is not right to teach. It was one of them, the very own prophet, who said, Cretans are always liars, vicious brutes, lazy gluttons. That testimony is true. For this reason, rebuke them sharply so that they may become sound in the faith. Okay, so here we have a description, and it's not a very positive uh, a, a description, is it? It is a, it is a very negative. We see what is actually happening. So there is uh, a lot of gossip going on. There is a lot of abuse by leadership that who are profiting off of their uh, their leadership within the churches. Um, they are being accused of manipulating people and benefiting from the people who they are, are pastoring or who are leading. Um, they are teaching sordid uh, information, things that are not true. And they have been called liars, vicious brutes, and lazy gluttons. Now that's pretty stark. And Paul is not actually 
using those words himself. He has, he's not the one that initially said those words, but that is a proverb that was uh, that floated around. It was the reputation that Cretans had. So Cretans were not well respected by Rome and they were a colony of Rome, but this was their reputation. They had a reputation of being liars, brutes, and lazy. Um, so there's a lot of negativity going here and Paul says it's all true. He says this is not just a, a proverb to ignore, but rather a pretty accurate description of what is happening within the churches. There, he also points out that there are those of the circumcision party. So the circumcision party would have been Jewish uh, people who have said that they are Christians, but who are claiming that you must be circumcised before you can become a Christian. And if you remember, Paul addresses this in the with the churches in Galatia, and that would have been very at the very beginning of his ministry with that particular letter. But here it seems to be a problem, and perhaps this is part of the doctrinal uh, problem that was going on within the churches at Crete. So Paul has a long list of problems that are uh, that are happening in these churches. Some of them seem to be theological, where they have uh, they, they don't have a true understanding of what the gospel really is. And then there are all kinds of ethical issues where people are just living um, in they are they are not they are living in rebellion and they're not obeying the commands of God. So this letter is giving Titus instruction of how to address these issues with first the leadership in the churches and then with the people themselves. And so we won't cover all of this um, in our Sunday School lesson today, but if you were interested in it, you can read the rest of chapter one and you can see where um, how Paul uh, identifies how Titus is supposed to address these different groups of people. But let's go now to chapter one and we'll look at the first four verses and we'll see how Paul begins his letter to Titus. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that is in accordance with godliness in the hope of eternal life that God who never lies promised before the ages began. In due time, he revealed his word through the proclamation with which I have been entrusted by the command of God, our savior. To Titus, my loyal child in the faith, we share grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. So Paul identifies himself here in two ways. He says he's a servant, or uh, some translations would say slave of God. And this means that Paul is presenting himself in a very humble way. He sees himself as one who's not calling the shots, but rather he is obeying God the Father and doing what God tells him to do. And he also says he is an apostle of Jesus Christ, which means that he is a representative. He is, a, he is the messenger. So he is a message for the people. He has been sent as a messenger by Jesus Christ. And that message is the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is his job. He is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in order to strengthen the faith of those um, who are responding, of those who are coming to Christ. He is charged with presenting, um, proclaiming the word of God and allowing people to hear about Jesus. So he is, he is a man who is living out his calling, what God has called him to do. He is proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ. And he is talking about this in terms of eternal life. Now, Paul has a framework of way he sees the world. It's the way the Jewish people of the first century would have seen the world. And everything that he talks about in terms of Jesus Christ fits within this framework. So let's talk about the framework for just a minute. That is, he sees time or history as being divided into two parts. There is the current age where these first century Christians were living. And this current age uh, is the age where they are living under the oppressive rule of Rome. The Jews felt this way, that they were living under the oppress oppressive rule of Rome. And they look forward to the time, to the age to come, which would have been the second age that Paul is talking about here. The age to come when Jesus Christ would, well, not the, God's Messiah, 
um, would come and when God would send his anointed one and when the Messiah would come, then no longer would the Jews be living under the oppressive rule of Rome. And so they would have been liberated from Rome and they would be living under the rule of God's anointed one and they would be ruling with God's anointed, anointed one and they would have... Um, they would see life uh, would be restored as it was in the time of King David. So there's the, the age that they're in and the age to come. Now, Paul is writing to say that there has been an inbreaking of God's rule and reign, an inbreaking of the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ, with the incarnation of Jesus Christ, with the arrival of Jesus in the world, God's own son, God's anointed one, God has begun to bring his rule and reign to the world. And so it's as though that there will be a banquet one day, a heavenly banquet when Jesus Christ returns. We, we, um, we say this in our communion liturgy every month, that there will be a heavenly banquet and we're going to feast together at this, in this perfect uh, time and place when Jesus returns. But until that time, we are not living in the world as it used to be. We're not living in the darkness of the world before Jesus, but Jesus has brought the light of God into the world. And so we have an appetizer. It's as though we have a foretaste uh, with God's love and God's grace and God's peace of what it's going to be ultimately in the age to come. And so because we are living with this foretaste, we are able then to enter into the life of Christ in the here and now, even as we look forward with confidence to the hope that Jesus Christ will return. And remember that idea of hope is not wishful thinking, but it is confident expectation that one day Jesus is going to come again and all things will be set right. Everything broken will be put back together again. Uh, everything will be renewed and life will be perfect as God intends. We will be perfect as God intends. But until that time, we live with the expectation that that is going to be. And we live um, knowing that this kind of life begins to be possible within us and around us because of what Jesus Christ has done. And so this is Paul's message. This is the this is what Paul is proclaiming um, to as he as he gives the testimony of what Jesus Christ has done, and he tells uh, Titus, his child in the faith, his spiritual child, he wishes him grace and peace. And so it's the idea here is that God's grace, we receive God's grace, and then as we receive God, God's grace, we also receive His peace. God's grace makes peace through Jesus Christ possible. So this is how. Paul begins the letter to Titus with, this, with setting this foundation that this is the way you see life. And because you see life this way, now you are going to live differently. And so now he moves into the direct application. And we'll look at chapter 2 and begin with verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly. So here we have this idea that because of all that Jesus Christ has done, because of the way uh, that we have the inbreaking of the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ, because we have this hope for eternity, now we are called upon to live godly lives. Um, and we renounce the worldly passions. We renounce, we turn away from sin. We turn away from unethical behavior. We turn away from this, this worldly way of life. And now we are learning to live according to the plans and the principles of God. And what does that look like? When you say, I'm going to obey God, what is it going to look like? And Paul gives us three words. He says, we're going to be self-controlled. In other words, our passions are not going to dictate our decisions. We are going to let um, the Holy Spirit work within us and, and, and be the one who, who guides us. We are no longer uh, influenced by the world. We are going to be upright. We are going to live with righteousness. We are going to live um, and make ethical decisions. 
and we are going to live godly lives. Um, I think the idea of living godly lives is, is twofold. It's the idea of living according to God's commands, but it's also the idea that this is possible because God makes it possible. We are relying upon God, and God is the one who makes it possible for us to live godly lives, or as First Peter says, that we are called to live holy lives. We are called to be set apart from the rest of the world and to live according to God's plans and principles. And this is being done while we wait on the blessed appearing of Jesus Christ. So we, in the meantime, we're in this, we're, we are in, um, in the in-between. Uh, we, we know that Jesus Christ has come, but we are waiting upon his return. So in the meantime, this is the way we are to live. Instead of living as that description that, that Paul gave early in chapter one that we started with, where these people were living and they were, they were liars, vicious, brutes, and lazy gluttons. It's a contrast here um, that Paul is setting up that when we are Christians, when we have um, placed our trust in Jesus Christ, then there is going to be a different way of living because of what Jesus does in and through us. He it is who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. So the idea of redemption there is to buy back. He has paid the price for our sin. So we are no longer under the control of sin. We have been set free from sin. And now he is purifying for himself a people of his own. So we have been set free from sin, and that is the idea of justification um, through our faith by God's grace. And now we are being purified, and that's the idea of sanctification. We are being made more and more like Jesus Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit within us. And not only are we living ethical lives that he's already mentioned, but we are zealous for good deeds. Look at verse 14 again. Let's read it all the way through. He it is who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, that's justification, and purify for himself a people of his own, sanctification, who are zealous for good deeds. So because we have been saved by Jesus Christ, because our sin has been forgiven, because we have been set free from sin, we live not only um, with, with integrity, but we also have this zeal, this passion for goodness, passion for um, righteousness in the world around us. We have this intent to do good things in the world around us. And it's not something that is pushed upon us, but rather it comes from within us. And I think this is so important for us to recognize because if we ever reverse this, then we put ourselves in this situation where we are um, sinking into legalism, where we are earning God's approval. But no, we are saved by grace through Jesus Christ. We are put right with God. We are reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. And because of what is happening within us, as the Spirit begins to work in us and we are changed, we become people who want to live with integrity. We become people who are zealous to bring God's influence into the world, God's goodness that we have experienced, we want others to see it and taste it and know it as well. And that becomes a uh, characteristic of our lives and that becomes our mission uh, to take to the rest of the world. We are zealous for good deeds. So Paul ends, um, summarizes this and gives Titus this last phrase, declare these things, exhort, and reprove with all authority and that let no one look down on you. So there is this urgency about this message. There is this, um, this appeal that Titus is supposed to be strong in the way he addresses these things within the community of faith. So I think when I reflect on the, this particular scripture and perhaps you have some insight that you would share with your class as you discuss this, one of the things that occurs to me is that this letter is written to a, a leader within the church um, and it is the urging to make sure that that leader then turns to other Christians and gives them this exhortation. 
uh, that, that he is to declare these things. He is to exhort and reprove with all authority. He is not to hold back. He is to hold people accountable who were already Christians to the sound doctrine and the truth of what God has done in Jesus Christ and the difference that it makes in our lives. So here is the question. Do we hold one another accountable? Are we people who are willing to exhort one another? Are we people who are willing to urge one another uh, to, to obey, to live in relationship with God? Do we feel that this is something that God calls us to do? And it's so interesting because Paul is not telling Titus to take this message outside the church. This is not the message that Paul is to, that, to, that Titus is to preach to those who don't know, yet know Jesus. This is the message that Paul is urging Titus to preach to Christians. Christians who have failed in the way they are to live, and Paul is urging Titus to tell them there's some accountability here. And if you are a Christian, you should see this in your life and the choices that you make in the in the way that you orient your life and how you are to live. So I think an interesting question for us to reflect personally and also to express to one another is, are we willing to do this and what does it look like to do this in love and Christian love? Um, and how do we respond when someone else perhaps wants to hold us accountable? What is necessary for us to be able to have this ability to speak this way to other people? What kind of relationship do we need to have with our brothers and sisters in Christ in order to be able to urge them to live um, with this kind of integrity and this kind of attention to doing good deeds? And when is it appropriate for us to speak and when is it appropriate for us to hold and be silent? So prayerfully consider that and perhaps even discuss it in your class today. It's great to be with you. Thank you for this opportunity to share God's word and I hope you have a great week and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye.